Welcome to the Nautical Institute, the international body for maritime professionals. Helping our members to develop their knowledge and professionalism lies at the heart of what we do. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, my membership in the, the Nautical Institute has allowed me to grow as a mariner. It helps you interact and network with other like-minded individuals all over the world. Our industry is changing rapidly and you are having to cope with new regulations, new technology, and evolving best practice. You will actually have to link up or team up with a specific branch somewhere in the world, and they will give you feedback, their views. I think that just really adds to your professionalism, and it will basically be of great help. Our website is the first port of call to learn more about us and the ways we can support you. CPD Online is a programme that enables maritime professionals to keep current, to keep up to date. The whole programme is driven on templates that are downloadable from the website. So if you're at sea without internet access, you can download them and take them with you. They can be completed electronically or by hand. And all of the tools and guidance that you'll need to complete these templates and to follow the programme through are provided online. The Institute is a superb vehicle 
for ensuring professionals are able to keep up with their professional development. How else can you stay at the cutting edge? Another great advantage of membership is the Seaways uh, magazine, which contains many, many articles, is published every month and has a large amount of information for members on all kinds of uh, shipping and nautical activities. We have the ability to communicate with each other voice concerns, put that either on the internet, on the website, or through Seaways. The Institute produces a great range of publications and as a member I receive 30% discount, which is just fantastic. The Nautical Institute is about publishing best practice and one of the ways that we do that is through our publications. They are written by seafarers or experts in their field for seafarers. So they're in seafarers' language. They're there to help you throughout your career as you rise through the ranks and perhaps as you come ashore and start a new discipline. Go to our website at nordinst.org to find out more about the benefits of becoming a member. While you're there, explore the range of free resources, such as the report submitted under our Mariner's Alerting and Reporting Scheme. These confidential accounts of accidents and near misses are there to help us all stay safe, whether at sea or ashore. You'll also find out about the work we do to make our members' views known at key industry forums, including the UN's International Maritime Organization and IALA, the Institute is at the forefront of making sure that the mariner's voice and the seafarer's voice is heard and given prominence. I think it's really beneficial that the members' views are represented at key international forums such as the IMO because it gives seafarers a voice. Belonging to the Nautical Institute and Nautical Institute's um, philosophy of engaging with rather than disputing or debating, uh, to constructively engage with similar bodies with the common aim of running a safe and efficient shipping. That has tremendous value to the sense of control that an individual uh, member feels. The Nautical Institute also offers accreditation services that support industry best practices. As a member of the Nautical Institute, you'll be entitled to use letters after your name, reflecting your professional status. Having that experience, having those letters after my name, having the credibility of being a member of the Nautical Institute has really helped me in my career. It gave me an indication as an employer that the candidate was serious about the industry he was working in. You'll also have access to a dedicated members area on our website that includes discounts on entry to leading industry events. There is so much we can offer as a Nautical Institute. Our seminars, our conferences are absolutely top-notch. I got the value of being a member of the Nautical Institute, particularly through networking. I needed to meet these people to advance my career. Run by members for members, the Nautical Institute provides you with the ideal framework to support your professional role within the industry. Want to know more? Email us at member at or call us on 020 7928 1351. That's London, so dial country code 44 if calling from outside the UK. We'd love to hear from you. We have a tendency, uh, mariners do, to believe that our way in our little part of the world, this must be the only way to do it. And of course, there's there's a thousand ways to do it, and, and th that broadening of our horizons, it's good for everybody. The Nautical Institute provides that platform. It's a wonderful organization uh, which has an outreach which is worldwide. Without the Nautical Institute, I don't think I would be the mariner I am today. As an international, independent and self-governing body, the Nautical Institute is here to serve you throughout your career as a maritime professional. Good evening to all of you. I'm uh, Lieutenant Steve Thomas from Sri Lanka Navy. And on behalf of the Nautical Institute Sri Lanka Branch Youth Forum, I would like to welcome you all for the mini webinar series of the Nautical Institute Sri Lanka Branch Youth Forum. Topic for today's mini webinar is role and function of MRCC. And today's session will be live broadcasted 
in Nautical Institute of Sri Lanka branch YouTube channel also. I would like to introduce the keynote speaker for today's session, Lieutenant Commander Damit Disanayaka of Sri Lanka Navy. Lieutenant Commander Damit Disanayaka completed his preliminary studies at Prince of Wales College, Morotu, and joined Sri Lanka Navy as an officer cadet of 38th intake on 23rd October 2002. He underwent his basic training at Naval and Maritime Academy, Trincomalee. After completion of his basic training, he followed sub technical course in India. The officer has specialized in the field of communication, which he completed at India. Further, he has completed maritime search and rescue disaster prevention and environment protection course at Japan, junior naval staff course at Naval and Maritime Academy, Trincomalee, and defense services command and staff course at Defense Services Command and Staff College at Sri Lanka. The officer has been awarded with Rana Sura Padakkama by the president for four times for his braveness in front of the enemy at the battlefield. He has been awarded with command of the Navy's commendation also. Some of key appointments which he held are OIC on board, Coast Guard 48, Papa 432, Papa 424, Lambda 820, an instructor at Naval and Maritime Academy Trincomalee. He is presently performing duties as Staff Officer, Maritime Surveillances of Sri Lanka Navy. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Lieutenant Commander Damit Disanayaka, sir, to conduct the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm feeling a very pleasant uh, evening in Colombo. I hope uh, everyone will be feeling the uh, same in their respective location. So I'll be sharing my screen now. Once again, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, now, for next 30 minutes or so, I'll be speaking on uh, role and the functions of MRCC. Now, in the subject field that uh, we'll be discussing today, uh, you will be coming across a term RCC and with a uh, number of variants of it. Uh, you will find uh, MRCC, ARCC, uh, JRCC, and uh, RSC also. So. What are those? So first, we'll understand what these terms are. Uh, now, RCC. RCC is a generic term for uh, all the uh, search and rescue facilities where MRCC looks after the maritime distresses and ARCC looks after aeronautical distresses. Uh, the state can decide whether to maintain both ARCC and MRCC like Sri Lanka or either they want to have a JRCC while combining these two elements into one place. And again, a country should, uh, country could uh, establish a subunit under the main RCC. At that time, uh, it will be uh, noted as the RSCO's uh, rescue subcenter. And please understand there is no any restriction for any country to establish any number of RCCs within their area of the responsibility. Now, we should understand that search and rescue, the term for the area is a very broad thing. And the uh, topic we are speaking, the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center is only one of the major component of this broader con concept. And so I will take the approach to search and rescue uh, for the betterment of all of us uh, to going forward. Now, since this is a maritime forum, I'll restrict, it, I'll restrict uh, referring to the documents and legislation which are uh, pertinent to the maritime search and rescue services also. Now, please uh, go through the, this definition which we can find in the 1979 SAR convention. Now, think of a distress which is uh, reported to RCC, a rescue coordination center, whatever. 
So on receipt of such, so RCC will launch the operation to locate the person or the vessel or the unit in distress. So this process will cover the term search. And once this casualty is located, the RCC have to recover and evacuate the survivors to a safer location. So this part of the operation is literally known as the rescue. So with that understanding, so we'll move to the next slide. Gentlemen, uh, the responsible coastal states. Now the term coastal states is nothing but a country bordering to a sea or an ocean. Now they always consider functioning search and rescue services as one of their major responsibilities because the value of a life can be compared with anything in this world. And so we will explore the global legislation, what we have identified a little deep. Now, the world has identified the necessity of uh, promoting the safety aspect of maritime services aftermath of MS Titanic disaster, which taken place in the uh, 14th April, 19th. So then the safety of life at sea convention of the solar was established in 1914 as a uh, immediate remedy or the measure and it was superseded by its latest variants in 1929, 48, 60 and 74. So this convention, if you go through, you will identify that majorly talk about uh, minimum requirement of uh, ship's construction and uh, equipment to carry and the various uh, operations the ships should be engaging in. However, the regulation seven of the chapter five describes the responsibility of a contracting government of uh, to function a search and rescue service, which you can go through on the screen. Now, gentlemen, until the search and rescue convention or SAR convention we generally uh, highlight was adopted in 1979. And until then, there was no such international system to cover the search and rescue operations at sea. So the practitioners consider this as the Bible of uh, maritime business response mechanism. And the main aim, the main aim was to establish an international search and rescue plan. Uh, it was aimed at ensuring a coordinated SAR effort to save anyone at wherever they were distressed at any part of the world oceans. And apart from these two conventions, the Article 98 of the United Nations Conventions of the Law of the Sea also direct the masters of vessels which were registered under the, the under a signatory uh, state to assist anyone who are distressed at sea. Now, in addition, it also necessitates all the coastal states to function adequate search and rescue services while promoting the regional cooperation in search and rescue. Now, moving further, if you refer to the uh, International Convention of Salvage, uh, the 10th article of this document, it also urged the masters of the vessels it made them bound to assist the ships in distress unless otherwise making their ship getting into a danger or their crew forcing uh, exposing their crew into danger. And uh, in addition, they also direct the state who are party to this convention to make necessary uh, means to ensure uh, this requirement is taken care of by their masters. Now, this by the name is not a legislation. So, COSPA SAS's agreement is not a legislation, but it's one of the finest global initiatives in terms of the global so, It was a collaborative effort of uh, Canada, France, from USSR and the uh, United States of America. Uh, it was aimed and it's ongoing. 
as a satellite aided distress locating system now the agreement we are talking about the talking about it ensure the long term functioning of the system and worldwide uh, dissemination of uh, distress data and the location without any discrimination and support the international search and rescue effort as much as possible and finally to define the means which the parties could coordinate with this system gentlemen uh, after adopting the search and rescue uh, convention in 1979 the international maritime organizations uh, maritime safety committee or msc divided the world oceans into 13 search and rescue areas these are search and rescue regions and thereafter the relevant countries in these areas were permitted to delimit their own area of responsibility in terms of search and rescue so that is search and rescue regions now when the process going on the plan for indian ocean was completed in 1998 uh, during a conference held at uh, western australian uh, city and uh, through that we were gifted the search and rescue region we are enjoying or we are being responsible on today so uh, seeing at this it's uh, 27 times larger than our landmass and the furthest point is uh, nearly 820 nautical mile from the our southern coast now please uh, go through this definition which we we uh, finding uh, in uh, sa convention so you may identify a search and rescue region have a predefined dimension as well as it should be assigned with the uh, rescue coordination center now this is the point now we can start talking about the mrcc now i know that my audience is now very uh, conversant with the uh, rcc types of so what is rcc or mrcc or arcc what is so what's your opinion oh gentlemen it's nothing but a operational facility that you may find in the navy these uh, operation uh, uh, operations rooms or the port control facilities of a harbor similar but like all these facilities they also have some kind of responsibilities now for the rescue coordination centers they will be having two of them the first one is to promote efficient search service organization within their search and rescue region and the second one is to coordinate the search and rescue operations which are conducted within their search and rescue region or the area of responsibility so with our understanding of the rcc now we may explore the capabilities it should have now at this point i'll be referring the international aeronautical and maritime search and rescue manual which is commonly referred as iam summit so this will come in uh, come under three volumes the first one is uh, discussing on organization and the uh, management and second one is on uh, mission coordination which is extensively used at uh, rescue coordination centers to for operations planning and third volume is for vessels for ucfrs will be using Uh, this document when you are uh, appointed as the on scene command that uh, that will uh, the knowledge will be very fine at that time now gentlemen the imsr volume 2 now it divide the capabilities of a rcc in two groups now first one is the required group and second one it is desired group then the meaning of required is that is kind of a must you should have it and decide this it's better to have uh, with then understand we'll move what are the capabilities that uh, this imsr volumes uh, needed of a rcc
now these are the requirements now since we no one knows uh, when and where uh, this test will be taking place so the facility should be run for complete 24 hours or there around the clock and then it required to be manned by a group of trained personnel on search and rescue because this search and rescue is associated with the process that involves with certain procedures that you have to follow and again during the search and rescue operation the rcc require to communicate communicate with the unit in distress the person in distress and other stakeholders also now at most of the times these people are uh, not your nationalities so the english language proficiency of the employees is also a must at this point and when you are planning the uh, conducting of search and rescue operation charts covering your search and rescue region and availability of floating tools are also a must now gentlemen without receiving a uh, alert the distress alert you can't coordinate the distress so the facility should have the necessary equipment to receive the alerts and like various means you should have a in must have charlie and uh, you should require to get down keeper alerts and uh, the ready communications otherwise you have to have arrangements with a capable entity to have to get down those also and uh, the distress alerts received at the facility to be verified so and you should have you should uh, take down the uh, update of the situation at time to time also so for that purpose immediate communication or the reliable communication you have to maintain it. so you have to communicate with associated rccs within your own srr then uh, air traffic control units postal radio stations then mother units who are, who are uh, producing or providing you with uh, search and rescue units ships craft so and the search and rescue units who have already have dispatch to the uh, this is a scenario also so you should have reliable communication system established and this uh, facility should be uh, given with the national uh, operation plan like national search and rescue plan because these operations are very sensitive so it should be handled very carefully so you should know the what is the national guidance on handling of this kind of situations finally the center should be provided be, uh, should have the ability to provide telemedical assistance at persons who are sick at sea the mariners and uh, coordinate medical assistance and evacuate the casualties when required so after this uh, lengthy uh, list so we'll move to the desired list now these are better to have and uh, if you have uh, a big uh, uh, map uh, mounted on the wall of your uh, search and uh, search facility now which include in your search and rescue region uh, your uh, adjacent search and rescue regions and where you find uh, this search and rescue facilities it will be very helpful it will uh, uh, reduce time taken for your planning and uh, if you have the computer uh, resources like drift modeling application so it will reduce the time for calculation otherwise you have to do depth calculation in manual and uh, it will also increase the accuracy of your Uh, planning and you should have the archive data in uh, your databases with your data in this format will be very handy when you are handling the situations which have taken place few days back and uh, it's better to have domain awareness tool like ais based visual uh, monitoring systems and traffic flow monitoring system so it will help you to coordinate the search and rescue assistance from get down search and rescue assistance from the closest vessels uh, near the uh, distress uh, unit now after hearing all these details do you think uh, it is mandatory for a mrcc or rcc to provide search and facility facilities such as rescue facilities like boats vessels aircraft what's your opinion what do you think gentlemen no there is no such uh, necessary or a mandate but how uh, however if you have such capabilities it will be added value always now since that it is always promoted to establish rcc 
uh, within or adjacent to a facility which is already having these uh, capabilities within them. Now, one of the best examples uh, is the MRCC Colombo, which we have uh, collocated at the uh, uh, NHU Navy Headquarters uh, operations room. So we have the access to all the tools they have and uh, the headquarters, they have the operation coordination of the search and rescue units in the country also. And when a distress uh, is taken place at sea, so this will be the typical search and rescue communication system you will be finding. And uh, you may, uh, the RCC may have the direct communication with the uh, unit uh, in distress, or it will be uh, related to a rescue coordination center or, a, or an alert, uh, uh, sorry, alerting post. So alerting post is now nothing, uh, it's again a facility that have uh, the capability of receiving a distress uh, message and again, uh, transmitting it to a uh, rescue coordination center. And when a distress is reported to the RCC, so the, sorry. So when a distress is reported to RCC, so the response, uh, the process of response, will be coordinated under number of officials. So they may be employed at the RCC as well as they will be employed on scene also. So we'll understand and identify who are they and what they are doing. And first one in the hierarchy is the SAR coordinator. Now SAR coordinator is a top level manager who has the overall responsibility of establishment. So staffing, equipping and managing the search and rescue system. So Considering the size and the uh, density of the uh, traffic, so there will maybe multiple personnel uh, holding this appointment also, and uh, they will look after the uh, creating of legal basement of uh, uh, search and rescue uh, services and uh, funding. They will look after the funding required, and uh, they will uh, organize the training and establish RCCs. And uh, most importantly, they will take policy uh, developments like going into agreements with uh, stakeholders. Now, please understand that they will not engage with search and rescue operations. Now, next one in the hierarchy is the submission coordinator. Uh, so, short term is SMC. Now, he's generally the mission coordinator and is the supervisor of a RCC. And he will direct and supervise the conduct of search and rescue operations from the uh, rescue coordination center. And his crew will assist him with many functions like communicating with uh, uh, others, plotting, logging, taking down uh, the sequence of events uh, of the uh, maritime business, and importantly, this officer is a search and rescue trained officer who has better understanding of awareness, understanding and the awareness of applicating the search and rescue plans which are available. And the final one will be the on-scene coordinator. So in the term, he will be at on-scene. Now, the first search and rescue unit, the master or the in charge will be take the position of on-scene commander. But however, when two or more uh, search and rescue units are involved, so uh, some mission coordinator will decide to whom designated this uh, position is. Now he will think about the endurance of the vessel, master's experience and the training uh, before uh, dedicating, delegating this appointment. Now, uh, He's the one who's executing the uh, operation plan made by the submission coordinator, and but he have the uh, authority, ability to uh, make some amendments with the SMC's concurrence also. Now, with all this understanding, uh, so we'll uh, go through this flowchart, uh, which is uh, denoting the search and rescue procedure. Now, this first call will be incoming, then it will be, now this is the Sri Lankan, condition 
now uh, i have taken now yeah, is mrcc and arcc then think mrcc received a, a distress call but they understand it's not a maritime, uh, maritime incident so they will uh, uh, forward it to the arcc now think arcc do the same they will check whether it's a aeronautical one then it's not they will inform to mrcc now here onwards i will go through only the mrcc part now when it's a maritime incident yes they will check whether it's happened in sri lankan search and rescue region or not when it's not we have to pass this message or the relay it to the concern rcc but you have you will be uh, uh, keeping your submission coordinating position uh, uh, until you are relayed by the new rcc if it happen within the sri lanka search and rescue uh, region so you accept the submission coordination so mrcc execute the search and rescue plan so first they will uh, search and locate the uh, survivors then rescue them and taking them to the safer place now this is the mrcc action plan so distress alert or the distress relay is received at mrcc colombo so and then they will verify it now they will contact the uh, vessel in distress if it's if they can if they can and if this uh, distress beacon alert so they will go through the beacon uh, registry and they will verify whether there is a distress or not now if it's a false alert now nothing required so we'll keep it right but it's yes now we have to do the rescue coordination now first thing we have to take uh, down all the information so we'll uh, uh, call the ship and take down uh, take the ship and ships nearby we can get down the information and rcc will start collecting meteorological data where it will be very helpful later and uh, we can again verify uh, the distress by uh, ships operating nearby and a broadcast will be uh, initiated to inform the vessels operating nearby and apply drift module if the if it's applicable and uh, the uh, outcome will be given to the search and rescue units and uh, necessary organizations which are which require this information and uh, navy and the coast guard will be informed because they will be providing you the sarios so you will dispatch your search and rescue units for assistance and uh, notifications will be issued through our coastal radio uh, network colombo radio either the da the biggest fleet we are having in sri lanka and the uh, navy area coordinator will be informed to issue the warnings required and we are taking assistance from adjacent search and rescue regions if you require finally all these things what we have done will be recorded at the mrcc now with all this at finally i will share you some facts pertaining to the sri lanka search and rescue system now as for the local legislation gentlemen uh, merchant shipping secretariat hold always the overall responsibility of maritime concerns now however the responsibility for uh, maritime search and rescue uh, was delegated to sri lanka navy in april 2014 and then uh, onwards we are functioning the mrcc colombo at our naval headquarters uh ladies and gentlemen please uh, find the statistics of uh, 2021 of uh, mrcc assistance and we generally coordinate nearly 300 uh, incidents per year and uh, our national fishing fleet share a large portion of that and uh, we generate uh, reports weekly monthly and annually and these reports are based on the uh, coordinated incidents of mrcc and uh, the right most corner maritime safety bulletin is generated uh, for the use of our information fusion center and all these uh, publications are available at uh, our internal website so the navy participants could uh, easily refer them now if i go to the future plans our mrcc colombo will be uh, expanded or upgraded within very short period of time uh, coming uh, years not years months 
and uh, if you go through the uh, system uh, map uh, you will identify uh, we'll be uh, having a, a, a mrcc in colombo and mrsc in hambantota then these two units will be equally equipped and we will be having uh, hf mf uh, and uh, satellite communication include and uh, vhf communication uh, at mrcc as well as the mrsc uh, giving us the capability of uh, communication across all a1 a2 a3 uh, gmbss uh, c areas and apart from these two uh, we will be having uh, seven uh, it called subunits but uh, they, those are coastal uh, radio stations so we will be having a network of uh, vhf coastal uh, uh, vhf uh, radios around our country so uh, now it's almost 30 minutes and uh, i'm uh, at my last uh, slide uh, of the day so this uh, i will conclude my uh, presentation from here and uh, still uh, the promise to you Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Governor David Disanayake, sir. Uh, it was a great session, uh, which included uh, many details regarding uh, the MRCC and uh, its functions. Uh, so, as we understand, it's a vast topic. But uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, for your effort to summarize this session uh, up to 30 minutes, uh, which has to be fitted to our time frame of the webinar. So, without further ado, next uh, we'll move to the question and answer session. Uh, all the participants are invited to raise your questions which you have regarding this topic uh, through the chat box. And uh, I will forward these uh, questions to the two panelists uh, who will be answering the questions, uh, which will be forwarded by you all. So with, uh, let me introduce the first panelist uh, for today's question and answer session. Uh, first panelist is uh, Mr. Rashmi Zajainimala. Uh, he attended to Ashoka Vidyalaya and Nalanda College for his uh, preliminary studies and uh, enrolled with Sinek Maritime Campus in 2004 as a deck cadet. He sailed with the uh, Reedray North Tanker Fleet from 2005 to 2020. He obtained Chief Mate License in 2019. Uh, he joined Sri Lanka Ports Authority and worked as a Chief Sea Traffic Coordinating Officer. Presently, he is working as a Maritime Lecturer. Uh, as I can see, uh, the participants are actively participating uh, for the lecture, they are raising many questions. Uh, among those questions, I will choose uh, the first question. Uh, uh, Mr. Rashmita, uh, can you uh, explain us what are the in information uh, which should be recorded by the on-scene coordinator at the MRCC? Yes, uh, good evening and thank you very much, uh, Steve, for my introduction. Uh, as the Lieutenant Commander Damit explained, regarding the on-scene command as a representative of the merchant fleets, on-scene commander, sometimes because of the uh, cargo, when we are carrying about uh, some destinations, sometimes uh, uh, large sea areas like uh, Trans-Pacific or Trans-Atlantic passages, sometimes depending upon the speed, the vessels, merchant ships, they are doing about uh, 10 to 12 knots. So, on such occasions, the nearest land sometimes we are can be encountered, it's very far. And the MRCC, even though we are transmitting any distress alerts or distress messages during an emergency, it's very difficult to uh, render the assistance on such occasions, especially for the SAR, SAR missions. So the on-scene commanders are one of the vessels selected by the selected by the MRCC to attend in the assistant for that distress vessel. So basically the on-scene commander have, uh, once the MRCC have been decided any vessel as an on-scene commander. So he depend upon the facilities and the manpowers and the, all the resources what they have on board the vessels, the MRCC will decide the, who will become the on-scene commander on for that vessel. So he is utilizing all the other vessels around the distress vessel and given the best opportunity to uh, do the survival operation till the MRCC will reach to the on-scene, the location. So till the moment 
this information has to record in by the on scene command because and all this information what they are recording they have to relay to the mrcc and this is a like a, he's doing a coordinating part so detailed record of the all operations when any vessels render the assistance or any uh, aircraft reached or any other uh, small craft being launched by the, any of the vessels all these things and the arrival time and the departure times for the areas and the tracks of spacing that have been used any sighting sometimes after when sinking of a vessel numerous of debris like uh, containers or whatsoever the cargo or life crafts or life boats all of these deep breezes can be start floating on the water surface. So all this collection of information, they have to narrate and they have to uh, pass to the rescue coordinating center. So this is the normally the on scene commander's duty on such occasions. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, moving to the next question. Before moving to the next question, I will introduce the second panelist. Uh, second panelist is uh, Lieutenant Commander Pathum Ranavira of Sri Lanka Navy. Lieutenant Commander Pathum Ranavira uh, completed his uh, preliminary studies at uh, Ranavim Royal College Kandy and he joined the Sri Lanka Navy as an officer cadet of 45th intake on 14 December 2006. He underwent his basic cadet training at Naval and Maritime Academy, Trincomalee, Sri Lanka. The officer has specialized in the field of navigation and he has followed his specialization course at Navigation and Direction School in INS Vendruti, India. He has honed in uh, knowledge and uh, skills completing Junior Naval Staff course at Naval and Maritime Academy and Defense Services Command and Staff course at uh, Defense Services Command and Staff College, uh, Sabgaskanda, Sri Lanka, obtaining Master of Science degree in Defense and Strategic Studies from Kotalawa Defense University. Some of key appointments he has held during his naval career are OIC on board uh, Coast Guard 44 and Coast Guard 46, navigating officer on board fast missile vessel SLNS Nandimitra and uh, instructor at navigation school Naval and Maritime Academy. Currently, he is performing DUC duties at the direct, Directorate of Operations at Navy Headquarters as acting senior staff officer, Marine Conservation and Monitoring Unit. Staff Officer Operations and Supervising Officer OBST Operations. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Ranavira, sir, uh, can you elaborate as the relationship between uh, maritime search and rescue and uh, IMO? Uh, gentlemen, uh, I wish you all a very good evening. And uh, thank you, Steve, for your very uh, kind and beautiful introduction. Uh, gentlemen, uh, when we look at the recent history, uh, the prominence of uh, maritime search and rescue was uh, uh, identified uh, just after the uh, disaster, that is uh, Titanic disaster in uh, 1912. So uh, the requirement of uh, manning uh, radio uh, channel with the common radio frequency for uh, disaster signals uh, was identified. So uh, just after 12, uh, sorry, two years in 1914, uh, the maritime nations got together uh, to discuss, uh, to formulate or adapt a convention on uh, maritime uh, uh, shipping security. So, uh, however, they were focusing on two factors, that is uh, the reduction or the prevention of uh, shipping accidents, and the second, the enhancement of uh, survival at sea once a uh, situation occurred. So, uh, we all know that uh, in 1948, the IMO uh, got established, and uh, in 1959, uh, with, uh, during their first uh, meeting, uh, they discussed uh, about this uh, maritime search and rescue because uh, one of the key functions of uh, IMO is to uh, establish or the secure the lives at sea. So subsequently, they have developed uh, many conventions, treaties, uh, the systems like uh, GMDSS, and they further developed the SOLAS. Uh, so 1974 distribution and uh, the especially 
uh, search and rescue convention, the 1979 convention, because uh, the requirement of having a separate uh, convention for search and rescue itself was identified by the IMO. So they have developed uh, specifically uh, SAR convention that is 1979. So uh, this is uh, the evaluation of this system and this is the relationship between IMO and the maritime search and rescue. Uh, thank you very much, Lifang Founder Anivira sir. And uh, we keep getting uh, many questions from our active participants. And uh, uh, Mr. Rashmi Janimala, uh, uh, we have got a question, uh, what are the duties? of search and rescue mission coordinator. Can you please uh, elaborate uh, this question, please? Uh, yes, Thomas. Now uh, we have discussed about the on scene command. Then when we are coming to the uh, search and rescue mission coordinator, is the, actually they have a lot of tasks, like, like uh, establishing staffing and equipment and the manning of SAR system. Actually, all the coastal states coastal states and when they like a busy traffic routes uh, or the some remote islands in the mid of the oceans they have to have the good equipment otherwise they cannot uh, render the assistance like a uh, helicopter facilities or fast rescue boats or such system they have to man and the manning also has to be done and the establishing of the rescue coordinating centers and the rescue sub centers some for example now we are taking about uh, Colombo is the major, and apart from the Colombo, they have the other Hambantota and other remote area of Sri Lanka. They have the naval location that they, they are doing the sub parts of the sub centers. All of them they have to be conduct and, the, and they have to be in a coordinate and the providing the arranging the SAR facilities. Like uh, as I mentioned, you all the uh, aerial supports and the ground supports, everything has to be medical facilities. All of them they have to consider and they have to provide as according and the coordinating the SAR training actually all the personnel they, they are engaging in SAR duties they have to need get the uh, certifications and their trainings updated trainings all of these things they have to give and then developing of the SAR policies actually as I mentioned you the la latest edition of the IAMSA manual is for 2019 so whenever the latest updates are coming they need to be updated on all these MRCCs and the sub-regions. Otherwise, the, as the, they will not fit for the international standards. So all of these things has to be, it is the prime responsibility of, uh, to uh, do the conducting on such system. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rashmita. Yeah. Uh, Lefton Commander Ranavira, sir. Uh, can you brief us uh, regarding uh, what are the resource agencies for maritime search and rescue uh, in Sri Lanka? Uh, yes, Steve, uh, there are plenty of resource agencies in uh, Sri Lanka for maritime search and rescue. Uh, so starting from uh, Sri Lanka Navy, Sri Lanka Coast Guard and Sri Lanka Air Force, then the Ports Authority, then the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, Department of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, the Merchant Shipping Secretariat, everything, every government institution is capable of uh, providing information, assist or uh, knowledge for maritime search and rescue. Uh, they become uh, national level uh, resource agencies. For apart from that, uh, we have some regional level resource agencies where we can get the support uh, like uh, the Indian uh, government, we have MRCCs, and uh, we have uh, recent region, uh, regional MRCs like uh, in Australia, Indonesia, Maldives, and we have even Cloud Player. So they become uh, the regional level MRCs, uh, regional level uh, resource agencies. And apart from that, uh, the ships or the assist at sea in the vicinity of that incident, they also become uh, the resource agencies for maritime search and rescue. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, uh, Mr. Rashmita, 
uh, can you brief us uh, the role of the on-scene uh, coordinator? Yeah. Uh, yes, Thomas. Uh, on-scene coordinator, on-scene commander, the both words are same. Sometimes it's uh, defined as on-scene commander. As I mentioned you earlier, sometimes the distresses are at the mid of the ocean. Uh, for example, as the Lieutenant Commander Damit explained, then from the Sri Lankan coast to the furthest away, the reaches the furthest away, the point on our coverage area is 840 nautical miles. That is when we are converting to the uh, kilometers, it's uh, close to about uh, one, uh, 1,555 kilometers. Normally, all the vessels are unable to reach on such speed at the instant. Even they have the helicopters, if they engage with the helicopters, the fuel sufficient is not the fuel is not sufficient to reach to the distressed location at instant. So one of the either merchant vessel or any defense vessels close by to the distressed vessel has to be appointed by the MRCC that till the MRCC assistance will be coming to the right location, till the moment they will be conducting all the duties of the MRCCs, which is uh, instructions provided by the MRCCs. And they can engage with other vessels. So these are the, actually, this is the role, what they are doing. But when we are coming to the actually some countries, we are not only the, because the merchant ships, not only trading in our, around the coast, but when we are going for US waters, as per the US Code of Federal Rules, CFR rules, it's clearly defined, not only for the search and rescue operations, but also for the environment because they had the huge impact with the Exxon Valdez after that incident. So much of rules they have been changed. The some of the countries they have the different rules on the territorial. They have the different inland rules. They will be conducting the on-scene commander even for the pollution prevention duties also. Not only the SARS but also the pollution prevention duties also. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rashmita. Yeah. And uh, Lieutenant Commander Ranveer, sir, uh, can you brief <coughs> us uh, the stages of uh, search and rescue? As uh, you have uh, already uh, briefed us uh, regarding the resource agencies for maritime search and rescue in Sri Lanka, uh, can you please elaborate the stages of search and rescue also? Uh, yes, Steve. Uh, actually, uh, there are uh, five stages of uh, search and rescue. Uh, first, uh, the awareness stage. So this is uh, the stage where the knowledge of uh, any person or uh, any unit uh, is having on the likelihood of the immediate threat of occurring uh, nighttime disaster. So in this situation, uh, the factors may be uh, getting developed. Uh, like the weather conditions or the technical conditions of the vessel may be developed that uh, which can be uh, developed to a disaster in a recent future. So the uh, second uh, stage, it is that uh, initial action stage. So uh, in this action stage, uh, initial action stage, uh, the communications will be established with the required uh, parties and uh, like uh, if you have uh, contact to uh, get the information from the regional uh, vessels or uh, any other uh, entity. So the communication will be established and amplified data will be collected. And uh, if it is an urgent situation, so the immediately the planning and de uh, deployment will be done because uh, we need to uh, respond uh, quickly and promptly for very urgent situations. So then the third stage is that the planning, so the development of planning, uh, development of search and rescue uh, patterns and the vessels taking part and how we are going to establish the communication and the requirement of getting the international support, this everything will be planned during this planning stage. Uh, then the operation stage, so this is the uh, stage where the actual uh, deployment or the dispatching of SRUs occur and uh, the assist will be uh, 
reached at the distress location, uh, location and uh, they will be uh, conducting the search patterns. They will be uh, carrying the uh, survivors. They will be transferring them for uh, further medical actions. This everything will be happened this, uh, during this operation stage. Then the final stage is that the mission conclusion stage. So at this stage, uh, the SRUs will be recalled and they will be remanned or refueled and uh, they will be re, uh, debriefed and we kept <laughs> for any other or future. So uh, in this situation, uh, this uh, stages, uh, in this uh, last stage, uh, every uh, documentation action will be completed and uh, the documentations will be uh, finished and compiled for further reference or further uh, legal, uh, legal actions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, Mr. Rashmita, uh, what does uh, SMC stands for in uh, search and rescue? Uh, SMC. The term SMC means SAR Mission Coordinator. Actually, SAR Mission Coordinator, uh, they are the one who uh, temporarily appointed, assigned uh, by the MRCC. Actually, uh, till the that same, but uh, on scene command, as we explained, they are the one who at sea, but the SAR Mission Coordinator, it's a land based, but they are officially temporarily assigned by the uh, MRCC during a search and rescue mission. So actually they have this, uh, some kind of duties actually, they will be the observing party of the evaluating all the data on the emergency and that whatever the data is transmitted by the on-scene commander, they will gather all this information which are coming about this distress situation from the all around the corner, they will be gathered and they will make a final report and ascertain the type of emergency equipment that they have been allocated and any requisitions and request of further survival equipment is required equipment and removing or inform to the prevailing environmental conditions. Sometimes it can happen at sea, the weather phenomena can be changes and all these weather prevailing information that has to be uh, transferred to the relevant parties like on scene commander or whatsoever the any parties engage in SAR duties. And if it's necessary, they ascertain movements of the locations of the other vessels. Now, actually, uh, here, the, uh, in fact, they have to maintain proper statement flow because all these merchant ships, those who are engaging to the such activities, they were uh, out of hire. So all these statement of fact will be very necessary for, uh, for, for, for the further their jobs, actually. They will be requesting by their charters and now they are out of charters. All these things, they need to be maintained and coordinating operation with the adjacent RCCs. For example, if it is covered with the several countries and all this coordination part has to be not only the one country as uh, all other status, states which are engaging into this operation has to be clear lockdown and all these statements and their uh, arrival times and departure time has to be maintained. All of these chronological accurate position record has to be maintained. And by the SMC, they will prepare the final report, prepare the final report regarding the that uh, search and rescue operation and their uh, <clears throat> actually uh, whatever the uh, achievement they have been done and the losses and all these statements. The final record is report is preparing by the SMS. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rashmita. And uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, that concludes uh, the question and answer session and uh, the events of today's mini webinar. I would like to thank uh, the keynote speaker and the two panelists for the efforts uh, which they have taken to enhance the knowledge of uh, youth seafarers of merchant and Sri Lanka Navy regarding this topic. We have we had a good audience today and uh, we observed the energetic engagement of participants who raised many questions to solve their doubts. Uh, we answered the questions within the time permitted, but uh, if you have further doubts regarding, regarding the topic, 
you are welcome to raise those questions in the youth forum whatsapp group as i mentioned earlier uh, this session was uh, live streamed in uh, nautical institute sri lanka branch uh, youtube channel and uh, you can watch this and earlier webinars also uh, on the youtube channel once again uh, thank you for your participation and uh, we would love to see your participation in upcoming webinars also. Have a good night, everyone.